Hi everyone and I'm Claire from Better Mealtimes. Welcome to my interview today which is with the lovely Mary Louise Cochran who is a good friend of mine and um, Mary Louise please can you tell us about what you do? Well thank you Claire. Um, I'm a storyteller and um, I have a character called Mrs Mash the storytelling cook. And Mrs. Mash loves stories about food. So I write songs and sing and tell stories and use comic props to help children and their families get in the mood for good food. Which obviously I absolutely love. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into it in the first place? Well, um, most of my life I've done work that's been sort of social work, community work, and <clears throat> when my kids were wee, um, I, I had an opportunity to be at home for a while and um, when I was re-emerging, um, I decided I'd like to do something that involved performing because I'd always loved performing, but I thought it was more important to be socially useful. So when I discovered storytelling, I realised that by telling stories about health, I was doing something that was both performing and was socially useful. Um, and when my when my kids were wee, uh, food was you know a huge part of my life. And my youngest son had a lot of allergies, so I had to cook everything from scratch, and I had to read every label and look into what was in everything. And um, so I was quite you know I was quite centered around food. Um, so I wanted to do something that would be fun around health and food and um, that's where Mrs Smash came from. Brilliant. So what are your favourite things then about what you do? Um, my favourite things about uh, being Mrs Mash is the love. <laughs> when I, I do a, a regular session for wee ones um, at the Skylark in Portobello on a Monday and over the years, I've spent, you know, every Monday seeing a lot of the same families and seeing wee children growing up and singing my songs and, and they'll come up and cuddle me or they'll tell me about how they're getting on or when they start school, it's always a big moment. So um, I love the relationships that I've had with um, some of the children that I've seen regularly. Um, but I think, what I, well, I really love writing songs and making up stories. So um, the creative part of me likes to do all of that. And I love working for myself, I have to say. So the combination of all those things is really great. And um, I get really warm feedback and that's, that's what I love, really. Oh, that's so nice. Um, <laughs> it just, you reminded me of when I worked in nurseries for quite a while and was regularly seeing the same children kind of every month and it is it's a bit of a heartbreaker when we go to school <laughs> you're kind of like oh no I'm never going to see that child again because you work with them in a nursery so yeah I totally get it and it is lovely to have those connections with the new ones and it is quite a privileged space I think um, because not only do I have a relationship with the children a bit, but really with the parents. I mean, a lot of mums I've had lots of food chats with or just chats about how they're getting on being a new parent, that kind of thing. Um, and that's the people that I work with regularly. But I do other things as well that are less um, regular. So I, I, I work in schools and nurseries and festivals. Um, and that's a more one-off thing. Mm -hmm. um, for a while I was doing um, cooking in schools um, because what I really wanted to do was to create a food experience where we would talk about the food, cook it together and then eat it together. Mm -hmm. And what I really want is for children to have positive, um, happy memories of making soup or eating oat cakes or um, finding out about where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not something that I'm doing at the moment um, and actually more schools are growing food and cooking which is great um, um, and the bit that I really love is the bringing it together is the the, the eating the food and um, experiencing it 
but, mm -hmm. but with a story and a song so that it's got a it's got a happy memory and that's how I remember things you know it's these multi-sensory experiences of trying new foods with other people or having a really um, enjoyable time somewhere and that you know it forms uh, a positive connection with with food mm -hmm. I mean recently I've been getting into um, I've been getting into growing during lockdown um, I I've, I've moved to a house where I've got a garden for the first time ever and um, I had some potatoes that a friend had given me that were sprouting so I planted them and somebody gave me some raspberry bushes and then I st started uh, growing some wheat in my back garden because I thought it would be a lovely thing, a little project to grow some wheat and um, it's just at the stage it's newly ready for harvesting so um, on my Facebook page I've been putting photos and tiny videos and things like that just to show the process of growing wheat um, so it's a bit like the little red hen Mrs Mash sows the wheat Mrs Mash grows the wheat and hopefully uh, Mrs Mash can make some bread out of it at the end as well oh I'm very excited <laughs> to see the end result of it <laughs> happy watching <laughs> so that's, yeah that's really cool and it's and it's so great that you know you walk the talk when it comes to all of this that um, and having been there with a, a child that has, you know, allergies mm. and seeing your way through that, um, it's it's fantastic. And I, obviously, from what I do, I completely agree with you in terms of it's not just about sitting down and eating. It's not just about growing the food. There's a whole range of experiences from the start to the end that children can get involved in, and it can really capture their imagination and get them curious and get them interested. And it and it stops the food being something just to oh it's dinner time oh i have to come and eat my meal um and you know it, it just gets away from that completely and gets children into a completely different zone of food and enjoying it and seeing it as something positive in their life End yeah. <laughs> so and that's how you feel about it Go yes on. and i i have i mean i mean uh claire and i we've worked together over the years and supported each other in what we're, we're doing because I, I think it's really important to work with other other organizations who are working with food and with children from the same you know from the same angle mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that that will develop as time goes on I would really like to work with organizations who've got more infrastructure than I have and I come in and deliver something around you know food with stories and songs i don't i don't want to be a big organization i want to work with um people that are good, doing really good work and there's loads of there's loads of great stuff going on mm -hmm. um so we'll see what happens i mean after lockdown i think there will be a lot of things shifting i mean the awareness of of food poverty and um with brexit and all the things that are happening <clears throat> you know it's a live issue how how we grow our food and where we get our food from um, but for children, you know, they just, they, they don't need to know all of that. They just, they just need to, um, have a good experience of food that they can keep for their whole lives, you know, because it's something that you have to do every day. And I really hope it's something that's a pleasure and a joy and not a chore. Could not agree more with that. Absolutely. Um, and as you say, we're doing this interview, um, in 2020 and we have been experiencing lockdown so it's very difficult um, for anyone that wants to work with children whether it's in schools or nurseries um, and and we're not able to do that directly at the moment so we need to find other ways of, of doing that and that might be working with other organisations or it might be working with people directly it might be doing things on video like we're doing just now so um, yeah we need to be flexible and respond to that don't we? both of us I think <laughs> So do you have any advice for families about reading and telling stories to their children? What would you say to them? Because obviously the pressure is more on them at the moment in the situation that we're in that um, parents are not able to take their children to the usual sort of activities mm -hmm. as much that they did. I know you're, you're doing your regular um, sessions on Mondays, but there's maybe a little bit less going on. So what advice would you offer to parents? For me, reading stories to my children at bedtime is one of my um, strongest positive memories. 
which is funny because at the time I could have seen it far enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so with you on that. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, when you're you're exhausted and the last thing to be done is to kind of read a story before you can finally get, you know, some peace to yourself. And your children are desperate for just a bit more of your, um, a bit more of your time and your attention. It can be really hard, but it really, um, for me, it really has been um, that time where it's just precious. So um, I would say, um, don't worry too much if you're not great at reading to your kids. What they love is that time with you. So whether you're making up a story or reading a story or reading the same story over and over again or allowing them to read you a story by, you know, looking at the pictures together, depending on what age your children are, um, I think it's um, there's a lot more going on than just reading a story. But there's so much around if you read with your children and if you, if you enjoy books and reading that it, it, your children absorb that. Um, so whatever way you do that, even if it's, you know, not even, but if it's online, you know, if you're a person that doesn't read books, but you, um, you like manga or you like, um, you like things online, then, then your children see that and absorbing that becomes part of the culture in your house. And, um, I've got two boys, two out of my three boys are dyslexic and dyspraxic and they, um, they don't read books and they never read for pleasure and but they have great vocabularies and they love stories and they do it in different ways and they've, they've um, absorbed that um, from our house so I feel that's something that I'm quite pleased about um, and the other thing is singing you know you don't have to be a good singer to sing to your children um, and sing with them when they're wee because when they're older they may not be able to stand you singing. <laughs> at, least you're singing. <laughs> at least your children don't have you know a mum called Mrs Mash who's always singing all over the place. <laughs> well yeah I can see that but I have heard you singing and I have heard me singing and I know my dad are listening to you singing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> so um yeah, I I love that you know you don't feel that there are kind of rules that people need to play by when it comes to reading and that it is very much, you know, fit it in with what works for you and and what a great um what a great influence you obviously are on your own boys if that is the situation that they're not readers. They're not interested in reading. It's a, it's something that they find challenging, and yet they have got that vocabulary. So you've obviously brought that to them by talking, <laughs> by doing, <laughs> by, doing it, um, by actually reading, by singing, yeah. but in an auditory way. So mm. it doesn't need to be about having an amazing spelling. You know, being able to spell words. That's not what yeah. it's about. Yeah. So great. Um, and if I can ask you kind of a, a more kind of broader general question, what, what do you feel that you've learned over the years about feeding children and maybe about feeding adults as well? Mm. Um, well, it's interesting because it's actually a, a kind of learning thing for me still. I went out for a meal recently and there were all kinds of foods that I'd never eaten before. And I was plunged back into that experience of going, oh, <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> um, one of the things about being an adult is you have control over so many aspects of your life, especially your food. It's worth remembering that food can be challenging for some people, especially trying new foods. But you'll know all about that, Claire. Um, uh, I suppose what I would say um, is that children and food. You just don't want it to be a battleground. Uh, one of the things I've observed is that where there are different patterns of eating, especially when visiting relatives, there can be kind of meltdowns at tea time because the children are not getting to eat or to be in the environment or have the food that they are comfortable with. 
they're having to adapt to what suits the adults and then the children get in, in trouble because they're behaving badly and things like that. So my heart always breaks when I see that going on. Um, I really want food to be a, a good experience for children and uh, even when children don't seem to eat very much, they, they survive and they, um, you know, they go through different phases. So I've watched my own children go through different phases and um, come out the other end and go from having quite a narrow palate actually to uh, becoming older and eating lots of things that they would never have eaten in my house um, because they've eaten it somewhere else with their friends or with other families. So I would say, um, please, please be very relaxed about what your children are eating and trust that um, you're not getting it wrong all the time. Because when my children were wee, I think it was a pressure to make sure that I fed them properly and got the right food into them. And um, um, they seem to have turned out all right, whatever I did. I, I, certainly didn't get it. <laughs> I certainly didn't get it all right all the time. Um, but I, I want food to be um, a good experience for people and the importance of coming together with other people and eating and enjoying yourself. I think that's really core to what makes life good. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally agree with you. Um, and it is so difficult for parents, isn't it? Especially parents of little kids and especially if they're first time parents and they feel that pressure and they feel that kind of stress of I'm the provider, I must, I must, I must, my child must eat, my child must eat, I must make them eat. And, and it's this intensity, um, mm. it, it's almost kind of going back to that survival instinct where they're in the cave and they're trying to find the time, you know, the meat to go and feed their child with. Um, yeah, so I do really feel for parents of young children and it's so difficult to kind of get through that period where they seem to eat nothing but actually you use the word trust there and I think that's really important from my point of view with what I do as well is that there has to be some element of trusting from the parents to be able to trust that their child knows that they are eating enough mm -hmm. and I think the quantity is something that everybody really worries about and I'm sure you've seen this in your work as well that parents worry about the amount that the child's eating and I think society as a whole would benefit if we all just reined that in and took a step back from that a bit. I, I appreciate how difficult that is for parents to do and I'm aware that there's going to be parents watching this that are going to be really struggling with that. Um, and obviously there's work that both of us do that hopefully can help parents with that as well. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think the quantity thing is something that parents really worry about? Yes, and um, there's something about tea time and um, uh, the parent being tired and the child being tired and um, their blood sugars being a bit low that can lead to stress and um, which isn't really about the food. Um, so I, I would just encourage parents to just be very kind to themselves and, and just not get into really stressful sort of situations where they feel they're failing. It's, it's you know, it'll be fine. Yeah. And I, oh, I, I so love the way that you put that in parents being kind to themselves because actually, as a parent of teenagers, that kind of language is not something that I heard when my children were very young. It's really only language that I've heard in the past few years about being kind to yourself and being kind to yourself as a parent particularly and the pressure we put on ourselves as, as the food provider mm -hmm. is huge, I think, um, just in society as a whole. It really it worries me that we put too much pressure on ourselves and and also I agree with you entirely that tea time does seem to be the time where everything really kicks off 
whether it's blood sugar related or whether it's you know the child hasn't you know they've maybe been in childcare during the day and that's the kind of time when the parent and the child are coming together and you know perhaps is the that um very annoying thing for parents that the children only really act up only really express themselves with us because they feel safe with us they're not going to behave in that way they're not going to have that kind of tantrum reaction or that extreme reaction with um child care providers because they don't feel as safe so actually it's really difficult but it's a compliment to us when they're <laughs> able to kind of have that full-on tantrum because it says to us that that's who they feel the safest with. They feel safest to really express themselves with us. Um, but yeah, in the moment, incredibly difficult for parents. And yeah, we, I think both of us are, are working in the field of attempting to help parents out of that stressful situation. Is that, yeah, would you agree with that? Um. Well, that's with very wee kids, you know, as they get older, there's different, you know, there's different issues. And um, I think engaging children with food, which is what you do so well, Claire, um, is really important. And I think um, where children are engaging with their food, where they're getting to make food and be involved, involved in the process, that's a great way of uh, building good relationships with new things or um, um, being part of the family sort of um, the jobs that have to be done that kind of thing I mean the older children older children and teenagers you know it becomes less easy to control what they're eating because they're eating more out the house or they've got they've got money to buy food that they want um, and again that's another time to try not panic and trust that Hopefully they've internalised what basic good food is and even if they eat a lot of rubbish that by the time they're in their 20s and they're cooking for themselves, they've realised, you know, this is, this is a good way to do it, is to actually feed yourself things that make you feel good. Because that's my interest is, you know, I think food, um, I think food should make you feel good and not in a, uh, in a way that, that, sustains you and gives you energy and uh, makes you feel good about yourself and so this takes me back to knowing where your food comes from and and being involved in growing it if at all possible because um that's quite a that's quite a luxury to be able to actually uh, grow your own food but i'm loving that schools and other organizations are doing a bit more of that because if we know where it comes from and we know how hard work it is to grow it, then we're much less likely to waste it or um, to turn our nose up at it. Mm. Um, and and actually that whole kind of process of understanding where it's grown makes us more likely to buy fresh fruit and veg and cook with fresh fruit and veg because we kind of understand that process and I guess less likely when we we do get older and we're able to spend our own money, less likely to buy ready meals and more kind of receptive to what's that thing, I'll see if I can cook something with it. If we've seen it done before, if we've seen it done well when, as a when we're a child, then it becomes the norm, it becomes familiar to us. And yeah. I think that's something that I think probably maybe my generation or, or people who were born slightly after me have probably missed that we haven't really had that emphasis on understanding where the food's from. And so it just became about convenience. Yeah. So where can parents find out more about you and what you offer to them? <laughs> well, I do have a website, um, uh, Mrs. Mash, www.mrsmash.com. And um, I, that's just basically information about Mrs. Mash. And when I'm, when I'm doing live gigs, uh, I put some of, of what I'm doing there so you can find out more. I have a few resources there as well because um, there's a limit to, to where I can actually be in person. So some of my songs, I've put them onto a CD called Mrs. Mash Smashing Songs and you can get that from the website. And also uh, a lovely picture book called Cake for the Fairies. 
um, which has a recipe for fairy cakes at the back as well. So I'm trying to um, um, I'm trying to do some stuff on Facebook. There's a number of videos there on my Mrs. Mash Facebook page that um, for wee ones, um, if uh, it's a lot of songs and rhymes and things like that. So I try and put some material there for anybody that's stuck in the house and not able to get to their normal play groups and things like that. Yeah. Brilliant. And I, um, I have to say, I do love the book and the CD. <laughs> I know it's, it's a while since you've produced them, but um, the, the CD, the songs on the CD are just so lovely and I've heard it played in nurseries and it's just nice to hear it kind of in the background being played and and just that kind of positive, you know, we've, we've kind of touched on some things today that are perhaps a bit of a challenge when it comes to food, but the the kind of response of, you know, let's, let's have it as a positive influence, influence from when um, the kids are very young and just songs are such an easy way of doing that and reading positive stories about food is such an easy way of doing that. So I would definitely recommend to any parents out there who are thinking, is there resources that would help me? Then yeah, head to your website. Is it www.mrsmash.com? Is that right? Yeah. And, um, and I've been thinking about, well, what, you know, what, what can I be doing during this time where I'm not performing live? And uh, I've just made a little video for the lovely soup song. So, um, so there's a little, uh, that'll be coming via the Facebook page, um, uh, a little song to encourage you to make and enjoy soup. Oh, well, that's never going to be a bad thing. We all love our soup. <laughs> Can't wait to see that being performed on Facebook. I will be looking out for that. Um, uh, can I say thank you very much to you, Mary Louise, for chatting to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure and delight as ever. Wow, well, thank um, you. And we will catch you again on the next video. Please go to Mary Louise's website, www.mrsmash.com if you'd like to find any of her resources. And thanks for watching. Take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>